Chapter 32. I had no medication, no therapy, no diagnosis, and no clue that anything was wrong with me. I was a writer. Before that, I was a composer. It was 2007. Medication was a death sentence to the creative mind. The nurses had me fill out a questionnaire, and I answered every question honestly. One of the questions asked about violence and suicide. I confessed that in both instances of my children's birth, I had vivid fantasies about stabbing Anne, Daniel, and Tribble. I returned home with Lynn and a prescription for Zoloft. Do not stop taking these cold turkey, the doctor said as she scribbled the script. You must be weaned off it. I understand. When you think you're ready to come off of it, speak to us first. Schedule an appointment. You will need to be weaned off. One month down to every other day, then three weeks down to every two days, then two weeks down to every three days. Do not take yourself off cold turkey. I understand, I said, and took the script. And I did understand. When I, when I was ready to come off the meds, it had to be gradual. I memorized her explanation and took it to the pharmacy to have it filled. That day I began taking Zoloft. I slipped into a deadened state. I had a daughter I didn't love. I had a violent son and didn't care. I had a newborn I couldn't bond with. My pain subsided and with it I became complacent. The tension between Richard and I vanished. The relationship did not improve. Our marriage was not fixed. I just stopped caring. Angel stopped screaming. My nightmares, all of them, the deaf men in their room, stopped. Everything went silent. The medications killed the pain along with everything else I cared about, save for the boredom. Turns out, boredom and logic were exactly what I needed to accomplish what I was about to begin. I had spent my pregnancy pouring myself into my writing. I had taken a course that steered me toward nonfiction writing. I hated nonfiction writing. Wait. They explained how to build a writing career out of nonfiction articles, but I wanted nothing to do with magazines and articles. I wanted story. Almost immediately, I began writing my first novel. It was November of 2007 when I started. The process consumed me. I wrote from 7 a.m. and stayed up until 2 a.m. every night. My husband worked nights and slept days. Aside from diaper changes and feedings, I paused only to cook dinner, clean house, read to the children, and put them to bed. At seven, I returned to my writing for the next five to seven hours. I tried returning to work at the store, but Richard made it clear he wouldn't watch three children and had me cut my hours back to almost nothing. My book consumed me, and my determination replaced the emotions I couldn't feel. I spent my days researching and writing. I poured myself into that story, and in May of 2008, I finished the rough draft. I listened to the front door close, no different than any other day. Richard looked at the mess on the floor. What'd you do today? That tone, that same tone that said, so I see you sat on your ass again today. I hadn't cleaned that day. I had been so close to the end that I worked through and pushed myself to finish. I finished my book. Great, his voice dripped with sarcasm. I opened an account on Facebook. I said, when were you planning on washing the dishes? If I hadn't been on Zoloft, I would have cared. It was as if there was a mesh screen enveloping me. I didn't feel. The meds had shut me down, made me complacent. He was shouting, and I didn't care. Why don't I care? I've been at work all day. I looked at the children's toys and laundry that had piled up that day. Why were you just sitting here on the computer? The dishes hadn't been done yet. I'm hungry, and I doubt you made dinner. Why don't I care? My five-year-old screamed. What happened, Anne? Richard bellowed. Tears streaked her little face. Daniel bit me again, she cried. A set of full incisor marks pierced her white skin. I don't care. My daughter was crying. I should care. My son had bit her. Why don't I care? I don't think I should take my... I think I should stop taking the meds, I said slowly. What? Richard looked up from Anne's arm. Daniel had gone back to playing. Richard hadn't moved to discipline Daniel, and neither had I. No, he said. You're not coming off those meds. This is the most I've been able to live with you. You're staying on them. The crying and screaming and yelling ensued while I stood in my living room, not caring. You will need to be weaned off slowly. One month down to every other day, then three weeks down to every two days, then two weeks down to every three days. Do not take yourself off these meds, cold turkey. Richard hated hospitals. He wouldn't take me to the doctor. Do not take yourself off these meds, cold turkey. I was alone. It was time to come off the meds. Feelings slowly seeped back to me as if I had emerged from a long, dark sleep. I remember the very day. After four to six weeks of gradually decreasing my own dosage, 
I woke and suddenly I saw the sun shining again. I felt the wind. Angels screaming returned and my boxes of emotions sat unscathed where I'd left them in the steel room. Only then did I realize how deadened I had been. By August of 2008, I was subjecting my book to the first run of revisions and had concluded the final stage of my weaning period from the medication. I felt great, substantial. I wanted to beat my chest and roar. I felt so alive. I was more active and involved. I was thrilled to be feeling again. That month, Richard came home with an announcement. I'm buying a bow. What? I want to take up archery hunting so I can get a deer for a change. Maybe with a bow I'll have more luck than with a gun. I knew our finances. We were consistently two weeks behind in everything and currently owed on the rent, the car, and the electric and gas. With what money? I said. It will only cost 500 he said. I'm sick of paying bills and never getting anything for me. And I have a bonus check coming, so I'm doing it. The expense is wasted unless I get a deer. But if I get a deer, it will more than make up for the expense we have in meat. You need to know. I'll have to be out there every chance I get. At the end of the day, it was his money and his choice. I nodded, held on to my worries, and said, What I've always told every man. Okay. By the end of August, the 500 allotted expense had grown into 2000 The rent, electric heat, and car payment were unpaid. But Richard had his compound, crossbow, accessories, license, hunting license, and was gone. Gone? William said. That's right, I nodded, for three months. Three months, he asked. I nodded again. Where? I shrugged. Don't know. Hunting, I think. Not sure where. He left in August and didn't come back until November. William stared in silent awe. I took his lack of response as consent to continue. He would wake, take his bow, and go hunting a few hours before he was expected at work, and all before the kids were out of bed. After work, he went hunting, was out long after the kids were in bed. The kids? William crunched his face in disgust. What about the kids? I mean, how did they take this? He didn't see them once in those three months, I said. The children asked in September, wanting to know where their father was. I told them he was hunting the entire month. In October, they asked me the same question, and I answered. They cried and wailed over how much they missed him. I held and hushed them and loathed him for what he was doing to them. I never saw him myself, but I didn't miss him. He came home only after I was in bed. Some nights, he didn't come home at all. I proceeded to love and harbor my children, and by November, the tears and questions stopped. We adapted and settled into a routine as if he had died. He simply wasn't there. He still didn't know I had taken myself off the meds. Every ounce of my spare time went into my book, but for the first time since Richard moved in, I was at peace. I was content to be cloistered away, fearing men, harboring, enabling, and nurturing my issues that I didn't know were there. William shook his head in disbelief. I arched my brow in question. To be gone from your kids for three months, William said. I nodded. For three months. William made a face reflecting his doubt. You don't really think he was hunting, do you? He asked. I chuckled. Are you implying that he was cheating on me? Yes. I shrugged. Don't care. I'm not a jealous lover. You were his wife, William said. I'm not a jealous lover. William wasn't believing it. There was one day Richard came home to tell me he almost had an affair. I said, I didn't care. You didn't care, William asked. I asked him what I had done wrong. He said I had done nothing wrong and said, okay. I wasn't jealous. I only cared that I hadn't upset him and that he wasn't unhappy with me. How? One of Pissant's favorite games was kissing Elena in front of me. Pissant knew I loved him. He knew I was jealous. He would make out with her, his eyes open wide, and watch me writhe with jealousy off or an ego stroking at my expense. I am very familiar with jealousy, and it's an emotion I haven't permitted myself to feel in years. No jealousy, William asked. I shook my head. None. I've locked it away in a little box. How? he asked. How can you be okay with your husband sleeping with another woman? Because I don't view my husband as mine, I said. People aren't possessions. Husband and wives aren't possessions. They are people. People with choices and with rights to those choices. They are allowed to make mistakes, to love others, to stumble and fall. Jealousy doesn't permit mistakes. It is there to tell us when something threatens our turf. I don't believe people are turf. The fear of loss leads to a desire to possess. That is what jealousy really is. It is the act of saying, I want to keep you to you myself so that I can't lose you. I believe this is at the heart of most marriages. Jealousy enables possession. But what about loyalty, William asked. Aren't you hurt that he betrayed you? Betray me? I asked. How did he betray me? He broke his promise to be loyal and faithful. I shook my head. To have and to hold. From this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, 
until death do us part. Nowhere in those vows is sexual loyalty, or any loyalty for that matter, mentioned. Besides, I think very little of marriage vows. Why? They are the details of a business contract, I said. Think about it. A promise to love someone forever. You know my views on love and how it changes. That is a prey crust promise. We don't know what the future will be, which is why the divorce rate is so high. People change, and marriage doesn't permit that. Couples promise to take care of each other in good times and bad, William said. I waved my hand, dismissing the concept. I did that with Trivel, my children, and my dearest friends. And I do it without the obligation of a promise. Yes, I can choose to walk away any time that I want. I have that freedom, and I will keep it. But it is by choice that I stay, which makes my reasons for loving, caring, and giving to one of my friends all that more sincere. I am not bound to those I love. It is simply something that I have chosen. Marriage will actually devalue my actions. So marriage has nothing to do with loyalty to you, he asked. Marriage is about possession and ownership, I said. The unspoken promise that is really made during a marriage is that I promise I won't have sex with anyone but you for the rest of my life. It's about owning another person's sex as if sex were corporeal. That is what people make marriage about. Couples hold each other to that unspoken promise so that if their partner strays, they just have they have just cause to have be more hurt, more vindictive, more aggressive if they change, which marriage leaves no room for. Then where does the sex belong if not in a marriage, William asked. Sex is only an extension of romantic love, I argued. Love is love, ever-changing and constantly in motion as our people. We've discussed this. They are, we are not stagnant. If I were to love you, for example, there is nothing to say I couldn't love you in a week, in a year, or in five years. None of us will ever know when we will love. For how long, how strong, or with whom? The only constant about love is that it will change. Sometimes it fades, sometimes it grows and ages like a single malt scotch until it's smooth, going down, and palatable. And sometimes the batch goes bad. The only difference between a friend and a lover is the sex, and the sex invariably follows with where the heart goes. So you're proposing that sex is an extension of love, and if love is forever changing, then you stand a high risk of cheating, William said. Yes, I said. So of course the majority of marriages are doomed to failure. Marriage is a gamble, and the stakes are high. So you promote infidelity, William said. I promote truth, I said. I'm just trying to figure out why we're pushing so hard for a system that has a 50% failure rate in climbing. Everyone is questioning the ethics of man and the decline of religion. I am questioning the system and the philosophy behind the system itself. William remained silent, pondering my argument for a moment. I grew up in a Christian home where I was taught to pursue a cookie-cutter marriage, I said. Many promote this ideal, insisting it's right. But if it's so right, if it's an ideal, then it should work for everyone. But it doesn't. It doesn't work for more than 50% of the population, and it didn't work for me. There are those who say it can, and maybe it can work for some people. I believe that cookie-cutter marriage was designed for those few adults who lived the ideal childhood. But where does that leave people like me, who can't conform to the ideal and who are told it's what we should want? Don't get me wrong. I think that the ideal marriage does work for some people. But pretending I'm capable of predicting the future, loving someone 20 years or a lifetime for now, is something I will not do. That kind of marriage has no place for someone like me. So you aren't proposing polygamy and debauchery, William asked, and I grinned. Oh, come now, I said. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of debauchery now and then. I managed a smile that set him at ease. No, I said, shaking my head. I support the idea of a relationship that works for you believe relationships should conform to the participants involved. I think there is too much emphasis on trying to conform to the participants to an ideal concept that may or may not work for those participants. I think that is why the divorce rate is so high. Too many people are trying to fit themselves into a relationship that cannot work for them. William nodded. Whatever objections he had, he kept to himself. Love, sex, loyalty, commitment, devotion, faithfulness, I said. These are not corporal things we possess. They are ideas, nothing more, and we have forgotten to treat them as such. Do not misunderstand me. These are ideas that I hold very dear to my heart. I believe these things are as an important part of our friendship, and they carry over into marriage. But I think too often we confuse the qualities of friendship with marriage and use concepts like loyalty and commitment to possess and control those we love to satisfy our own jealousy. I shook my head. Jealousy is the act of saying, I won't share you because that somehow takes something from me. But what if it doesn't? William furrowed his brow. If we were lovers, and I've promised nothing, I said. If I simply love you but sleep with another man, what have I taken from you? William shrugged. I'd be hurt, 
You'd be hurt because you're jealous. But take jealousy away. Remove the possession of another. I'm not breaking any promises. And you know my sleeping with another man would take nothing from you. If you had no fear of loss, then what would you have lost if I sleep with another man? Nothing, I guess. He still seemed unsure of himself. I sat back in my chair. What about exclusivity? William asked. He perked my attention. The feeling of being special. Now it was I who searched for a rebuttal. I furrowed my, br I furrowed my brow. You're talking about ego, I said. He nodded. I thought about it. Which isn't jealousy at all, I said. Ego. Re ego? Is this all about ego, then? We sat in silence for a moment while we thought. I waved a finger at him. See, now, ego I can respect, I said. Then you will have lost something, William said. You would have lost exclusivity, which then enters jealousy into the equation if you value exclusivity. I said, do you? I looked at William. Value exclusivity, he asked. I stared at the recorder on the table and shook my head. I'll have to give this some more thought, I said. The concept is too new for me to begin forming a hypothesis. In November, at the end of the first week, Richard came home. I was shocked to see him so suddenly within three weeks of archery season left. Why are you here? I asked. He looked beaten down and exhausted. He looked worn and ragged. I was out there and realized there were a lot of issues here that we needed to take care of, and I felt I should be here fixing them instead. I stared, too surprised with his answer to say much of anything for a while. You're saying you want to finally consider marriage counseling, I asked? No. He scoffed at the idea as usual. I would sooner get a divorce than go through marriage counseling. He dropped himself on the couch and went to sleep. I returned to my book. The next morning was another day, another revision. Richard was already at work. I set the coffee to brew. Anne was at school, and I had my cup of coffee. I turned my computer on. Thanksgiving was one week away, and my book was... My book was something. I opened Word, logged onto the Internet, and signed onto Facebook while I waited for my email to load. I took a sip of coffee. I heard the plink that told me I had a Facebook message, glanced up, and felt the blood drain from my face. My body had gone cold. Every inch of my skin buzzed like pins and needles, and all at once I couldn't breathe. I stared at the message before me. Hosea has requested to be your friend. 